So Inaya has just launched a new organization called Free Speech Champions. So I'll begin by asking Inaya to, to talk a little bit about what Free Speech Champions is. And why I'm looking forward to this conversation in particular with Anaya is that we've talked a little bit beforehand. And I think sometimes people can have a very, um, a very simplistic view of this. People are either sort of free speech absolutists or, well, mostly on YouTube, people are free speech absolutists. And I, and I'm, I was very pleased when Anaya and, Anaya and I chatted that she's got a, a much more nuanced perspective than that. So I'm looking forward to exploring that in the conversation. So Anaya, what is Free Speech Champions and what are you hoping to achieve with it? Yeah, so thank you so much for having me. And I'm really looking forward to talking about this. And I guess I'll probably just start about why I kind of originally had the idea to kind of start the, the project. And so the idea kind of came about in, in early last year and it was primarily for kind of two reasons. The first reason was because Obviously, there was, it was still the kind of peak of the conversations around cancel culture and freedom of speech. And many of the focuses was like, who, what, what can you say or what can't you say? Or this person shouldn't um, be demoted. This person shouldn't be fired. And it was kind of just you know, defending free speech on, on the principle that that person should, should be allowed to speak. And I thought that that was absolutely fine. But I think the kind of question as to why, as you kind of alluded to, why, why free speech has become so so difficult? Why has it become so challenging? What is it about this kind of political moment and this political epoch where the question of free speech is so incredibly contentious? And obviously the kind of phrase, the kind of price of the kind of price of freedom is eternal vigilance. The nature of free speech has always been contentious, but right now it, it, it feels much more, uh, it feels much more polarizing. It feels much more kind of um, conflicting. And so I, the, the kind of project idea started to try and grapple with what it was about free speech, which is really, really difficult. And then the second element is this question of kind of snowflakes and this idea that kind of young people are very much the kind of propagators or instigators of this kind of cancel culture due to being inculcated into this idea that kind of, um, of being hypersensitive, that the, that the kind of world is this kind of perilous place and the, and the best way to respond to it is to kind of try and censor it or retreat. And I'm not sure that was that's kind of absolutely accurate. I actually think that, you know, right now we're in a situation with the kind of um, information ecosystem that if you step into this fray, if you step in, you can be kind of vilified, you can be tarnished and, and, and all of those things can be kind of memorialized on the Internet. So in some senses, a kind of natural response is to not want to get involved in it, to kind of want to you know, put, put your head in the sand and get away. And so how do you kind of create a space? How do you create a domain where people genuinely feel like they, they want to engage with a wide range of ideas, the kind of very um, process to which we kind of cultivate our own sense of individuality and agency. So it's these twofolds grappling with in a much more kind of bottom up way as to why freedom of speech has become so contentious and perhaps creating those spaces and um, based off of kind of solidarity that empowers people to be able to actually take freedom of speech forward. So th those are the reason why um, it, it was started and it's still very, very new. Right now, we only have a few people. But um, since we've launched, we've had, you know, dozens of young people signing up. And it's just really, really interesting to find out that, you know, so many people do want to grapple with it, but there's not necessarily the spaces to do that just yet. And are there specific topics or specific areas that you think that, that this is needed more for? I mean, I'm thinking specifically, there was a piece on Newsnight tonight um, or maybe yesterday, I think it was, where an academic, a feminist academic was saying that she was being um, no platformed partly because of her views on gender ID and, and sex versus gender and that conflict, conflicting with some trans activism, for example. Like, mm. And I've noticed that there are a, a number of, I, I think there are a number of people in Free Speech Champions who that's kind of their their concern. I mean, there's there's different topics in different cultures, obviously, depending on kind of what the particular dogma is, what the particular yeah. kind of, and, and there's there's taboos on all sides. But I wonder if there are any specific ones that you are, that you're kind of most aware of. Well, I think in, in terms of kind of the kind of mainstream conversation, the kind of gender one does seem to be one of the most kind of cataclysmic at the moment. And I think kind of broader conversation about identity politics seems to be a significant domain in which the kind of free speech debate is happening. And I think that that is, um, 
reflected for kind of quite a few reasons. I think the identity politics debate um, reveals something, I think, kind of deeper about kind of where we are in our society to which people are increasingly um, finding kind of meaning and, and a sense of kind of identity and moral certainty in their kind of immutable characteristics. And then if you kind of, um, free speech is obviously the space to which you, you kind of shake up people's um, conceptions of self. And, and if you have that possibility to which you can kind of challenge people's understanding of, you know, who they are and how they kind of came to be and what their identity is, then that really shakes people up to the core. And so I think the kind of whole identity politics conversation is very much um, uh, a kind of reflection of a kind of a fractured um, conversation about our kind of sense of self as a society. What are... What are the topics that you feel that you have heterodox ideas about or views on that you're concerned might be shut down? Yeah, so uh, so I, I will answer that question, but quickly touching a point, um, touching on the kind of point that you just made, um, it kind of alludes to what I said earlier about um, this kind of whole idea of kind of hypersensitivity, particularly amongst kind of the younger generation. Uh, you know, I, I think it's an incredibly kind of perilous and, and lonely place, I think, for 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 kind of really getting involved in the free speech conversation for a lot of people. I, you know, you, you can be kind of smeared in a national newspaper and you have these incentive structures that now exist in which, uh, you know, guilt, guilt by association, um, wh where you will be tarnished, you know, why would you really want to do that? And I think, I, I think it's incredibly hard. Um, and in terms of in terms of opinions that I have, um, I, I'd say probably many. I, I think a lot of them perhaps have become you know, more mainstream now, but particularly kind of early last year, you know, in, in the kind of early kind of Black Lives Matter conversation, it, it, it was incredibly difficult when I kind of disagreed fundamentally with many of the things that were being said about the kind of way society was and the way kind of black identity is. And, you know, you, there's many labels associated with uh, ethnic minority people who, who don't necessarily conform to particular narratives that are kind of about race and identity politics. And an, another topic I'd like to talk about before we get to the Q&A, which is something that I, I don't know if I was aware of, certainly wasn't aware of to the same extent until maybe a year ago and sort of seeing the kind of narratives that started to get a lot of traction during lockdown. I know that we've talked a little bit um, offline about the London Real stories and the London, the London Real um, Brian Rose was the first time I kind of realized um, what a kind of, op that the incentive structure for misinformation seems to be accelerating. And there's a concern, it certainly makes the picture for me much more complicated because there's a concern of will truth, like the idea that the the idea that, which is very common in, in in YouTube and kind of the free speech absolutist idea is that the solution to bad speech is more speech, mm. and that that's effectively it becomes a self policing mechanism, and I think I think that now seems an incredibly naive perspective, after what we've seen with the 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 kind of just the incentive structure for misinformation. I mean, I'll talk about sort of QAnon being an example of that, or just we know that some narratives are very sticky. They're yeah. very compelling for reasons not to do with their truthfulness, but because they tap into some other kind of primal fears or whatever. And that that feels, yeah, that feels to me at least new to, to the degree that it that it sort of exists right now. And I know that that, that I, I think that's had an impact on your thought as well. So I'm interested in what you made of what you've made of the last year or so. I think that's been one of the um, most significant ways in which my my opinions on free speech has changed. Um, you know, I, I think you know, early last year I was very much along the lines of you know the answer to to kind of hateful speech is better speech and the, this kind of idea of the kind of free marketplace of ideas. But I think to me that that idea ha has significantly been challenged. And I think, you know, one of the reasons is, is the kind of unprecedented nature of the moment. I mean, we have the kind of decimation of the public square, whatever people's views are on lockdown. The, the reality is, is that we're kind of stuck in our own homes and the, and the way in which we kind of experience each other is increasingly in this kind of one dimensional way. And so, you know, previously, you know, we, you had had the pub you had the church you had the you know the park uh, a way of experiencing ourselves outside of our kind of political abstractions and so now we don't have that 
And so now we've kind of moved into this domain where all of our communication is obviously mediated through um, these kinds of uh, uh, social media uh, platforms that have all of these kind of incentive structures um, that obviously um, incentivize and maximize for, for the interests of, of the kind of structures itself. And so, you know, now where we are kind of these political abstractions that are kind of, you know, much more, uh, e even smaller often in the form of just a kind of tweet. Um, and we have this very, very kind of, um, kind of one dimensional way of experiencing one another. And I think kind of in that um, climate of also huge kind of sensitivity and tension and, and kind of anxiety and kind of uh, precariousness, um, the, the kind of narratives that capture people um, are, are understandably, I think, um, the, the ones that uh, are very Manichaean in this kind of good versus evil, where the kind of good people are very clear and the bad people are very clear. There's a kind of clear narrative of kind of salvation. Um, and all you have to do is, is kind of believe this or, or do this and, 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 you know, the kind of truth, truthful out. And, and I think the kind of conspiracy narrative fits um, very strongly um, into that. And I think, you know, right now, particularly again with the kind of the kind of lockdown conditions, you have to um, imbue, you know, those in power with a kind of extraordinary kind of level of trust, um, you know, and, and given that it's in a kind of social context to which the kind of erosion of trust has, has been happening for a long time. You know, I think for a lot of people, it, it's easier to kind of believe that um, that there is this kind of um you know, e evil plan. And so I, I do think that it's it's genuinely understandable um, in this kind of unprecedented moment um, why so many people um, have, have kind of drawn to um, to kind of these narratives because they're so kind of captivating. But I agree with you that I don't think um, necessarily anymore that the kind of good ideas um, are just going to win out. I think that we have to get incredibly serious now. Uh, firstly, incredibly honest about the kind of scale of the reality of how kind of difficult things are, but get incredibly serious now about rebuilding um, the kind of public square and kind of genuine civil society kind of solidarity building. And I'm, I'm not sure that um, what be, whether that's the kind of political elites, but also um, or ordinarily in conversation that the kind of the, the commitment and desire to actually move away, move outside of our kind of moral certainty and actually um, accept that perhaps the person opposite us, you know, may have um, something, knowledge that, that we don't know and we should, you know, approach them in good faith. I, I, I'm not sure that as a society we're ready for that, for that leap yet. Mm. Yeah, and it, it sort of just picking up on your last point, it feels to me like there's a the, the conversation needs to shift from where I feel like it often gets stuck, which is we need to make sure it, it's very much focused on the individual of like, are you being censored or are you not? We shouldn't censor this. Everyone should be allowed to speak. And can we shift the focus to what are the conditions for a generative dialogue or what are the conditions for, because free speech, free speech, if it's seen in isolation, like our societies are not built just on anyone, everyone saying what they say when they say it. It's more based on what are the what are the conditions for for that being possible. And do you have a sense of with with your project with free speech champions? Do you have a sense of are you going to grapple with that? Like, what are the conditions that that that, that need to be created? What are the what are the kind of ground rules? That kind of context setting. Do yeah. you have any, any concrete ideas about that? No, absolutely. You know, when it when it first started, you know, it, it, it's been a kind of really fascinating ride. You know, when, when it first started, I, I incredibly naively thought that you can just put a kind of broad range of people with fundamentally different political views together and just that are committed, say they're committed to free speech and just assume that that would kind of spontaneously emerge uh, a kind of uh, or, an organizing system. Well, I, I absolutely don't believe that's the case anymore. I, you know, I think that actually um, for, for people with very different views to be able to have a productive conversation, um, both people really need to know what the rules are. Both people need to really trust one another. Um, that there needs to be in a kind of assumption of good faith and an assumption of kind of charitability. 
as I said already, a kind of shared value structure, a sense that if some if this kind of broke down, would you would you have my back? That kind of solidarity building, um, a sense of kind of courage and and bravery, and and these are kind of uh, these are the kinds of kinds of structures that are um, that really support individuals to then actually um, take those steps to be able to 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 withstand somebody that is saying something that they find fundamentally alarming. And I think it's really interesting now. Seeing some of the um, some of the kind of uh, uh, apps or social media platforms that are emerging, for example, Clubhouse, which seems to be recognizing um, those necessary conditions and uh, experimenting and exploring if you can bring all of these different people together based off of shared values, based off of clear rules, based off of trust in a kind of um, moderating system um, to kind of kick people out if, if they're um, breaking those rules. And, and it does genuinely seem to be working. And, and, and so I think it is, I, I really think it is possible. And I think it's really fascinating seeing, you know, groups like yourself, also, as I said, Clubhouse on the cutting edge of this kind of um, experiment of in this new global interconnected digital space, how do we create um um, spaces to which productive conversation can can really be translated into um, positive changes in society. So, Nastasia, N- N- Nastasia. Hiya, it's hey. Nastasia. Nastasia, you had a really yeah, exactly. interesting question before about moderation versus censorship. Yeah, um, I'm actually one of the free speech champions that's on the project with Anaya. Um, she kind of sent me the invite to come along to the Q&A and everything. Um, it's nice to join everyone. It's been really interesting to hear the conversation. Um, but yeah, definitely, I liked your point about censorship and moderation. I think a key reason why I really joined this project is because I wasn't quite convinced that, you know, those around me did have the skills in order to distinguish between moderation and censorship. Um, I studied university at, I studied university, I studied philosophy at university. Um, and, you know, we really did kind of learn that you need to, you know, hear out even bad ideas and understand how like they're structured and kind of pick them apart. Um, but yeah, to notice then when having conversations with my peers that, you know, there was a lot of, no, we can't think that, that's not what we're meant to think, um, you know. How I don't think that there's a, a good base that's built up a, around young people about understanding um, the differences between the two. Um, and I think that does, it to some extent, come from media. I think there's a lot about where in the way that things are presented, you know, with, with Trump, I understand that in like a complex world, populism probably is dangerous. Um, but to present it constantly with kind of a already initial view about how you're meant to think about it and to not have kind of a, uh, kind of a proposal for how it's how you should like how you could think about something else I think that um that that's probably where it kind of tilts just to censorship and not to moderation because you're not you're not kind of giving people the skills to to challenge an opinion and moderate it and you're only giving them the skills um to censor it and I know that obviously you've got the rebel wisdom gym and everything I wonder if you have any kind of thoughts about how they could almost be like what what parts of them are most vital to a young person and their understanding of moderation and censorship differences. It's a good question because I feel like those distinctions often only become a little bit clearer once one has responsibility, whatever that is in, in one's life. And I think a lot of, I think it is quite hard if you've only been in a in a position as a like yeah in in so many areas once you're responsible for the space once you're responsible for everyone else's interaction in the space and you're then weighing up well if this person who's very disruptive shows up what impact does that have on everyone else does that make other people less likely to be able to speak for example then you start to and then you're weighing up well is that is the benefit of that person coming and is the benefit of that person speaking worth the disruption? And a lot of the time, the default now is I think if anyone feels discomfort in any way, then that's not okay. And sort of steering into discomfort, I think is a good is a good rule of thumb. But then you need sort of protocols or you need 
some understanding about what to do when you feel that. And so, for example, we, we run a course called Sense Making 101, where we, we work with kind of mindfulness and we work with like, we make sense first by understanding what's going on with us and knowing that um, like one of the hacks is we can either be in a curious open frame of mind or in a defensive frame of mind. And it's a physiological thing. It's moderated by the vagus nerve, but we can shift our, we can shift our state by being curious about it, by asking, oh, wow, I'm getting defensive. Why is that? And, and start to ask that question. We can actually shift more into an open, curious perspective. So I think you, this, this is why it becomes so difficult because I think you, I think you need to be able to have a situation where people have a growth oriented mindset to feel that when I feel defensive or when I feel challenged by something, that's an opportunity rather than a threat, then, then I think you have to kind of, then you have to weigh up, <laughs> then you bring in sort of like very difficult people or, or people who just want to challenge for the sake of it and aren't interested in being challenged themselves. And then that becomes a value judgment. Is someone coming in as a, effectively as a troll, like exhibiting sort of sociopathic behavior, like these are incredibly delicate and difficult conversations to have. And I, I don't know, I feel very fortunate that because of the nature of rebel wisdom and because of the nature of the conversation that you've had on the channel, most people attracted to it have that frame of mind already and are very much looking for generative. Com In fact, one of the difficulties we have is finding enough topics that we can disagree about. <laughs> yeah. um, people have kind of requested a few more disagreements and we've, we've, we've put some of those sessions into the, into the calendar. So dialogue and disagreement lab and all of these, but, but I think, I think we need to have a cultural movement around these bigger topics of bringing in concepts from mindfulness, bringing in concepts from trauma, trauma therapy, bringing in all these kind of bigger ideas. So Ali and I did a talk that got very, very popular. Like a couple of years ago, we went to festivals and did a talk that was effectively, um, what was it called? It, it, the, the topic of it was, was, kind of the science and psychology of polarization, the science and psychology of growth and challenge, science and psychology of difficult conversation, I think we called it in the end. And, and it was hugely popular. People were very interested in, these, in this. Like it was the most popular talk at the festival in that particular tent. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think we need to mainstream these ideas and build spaces consciously around those ideas so people know what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. And... And then we do need some kind of new form of dialogue that brings in um, brings in insights from facilitation, that brings in insights from the more sort of, I don't want to say therapy because that's got a sort of certain, a different style, but at least an understanding of psychology and understanding of, of trauma, for want of a better word, like anything overwhelming in the moment you could argue is trauma. So I think there's a lot of really amazing work in 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 that's coming out of trauma therapy, and I think is hugely important for the generative conversations. That would be I don't that sort of veered off in various directions, but I hope that was kind of useful. That I, I think that comes to what Inaya and I were saying. It's like I think the emphasis has to be away from kind of anti censorship free speech and towards what are the conditions we can create for generative conversation around difficult topics where everyone feels heard and move in the direction of if not resolution then at least a recognition of the validity of different perspectives yeah no i i would completely agree with that you know my only you know thoughts is that it's still an open question because i think you know some of these conversations um to some extent are are still um, you know, relatively mainstream, but I know that, you know, for example, you know, uh, Charles Murray uh, with questions of kind of IQ and, and, and there's some really kind of really difficult conversations that, that kind of bring up uh, history and, and bring up deep seated kind of uh, trauma um, that, that is incredibly hard to have, um, you know, conversations in the spirit of generosity and, and it, with, with those conversations. So I'm not sure. I, I think it's still an open question. Jochen, your question 
uh, has the most upvotes from what I can tell. So would you like to unmute yourself and, and sure. ask a question? Uh, Naya, thank you so much for being here. Um, maybe following up a little bit with the moderation versus censorship and then 4chan, 8chan, um, I can certainly see that not having any cohesion in a discourse is just like too problematic for reaching any any kind of conclusion across people. However, uh, I would imagine that if the moderation goes so far as to say that about half the people in the United States have the wrong opinion and should, should just be quiet, that might be too pushing it too far. And so I'm really wondering, um, like, uh, how much discomf discomfort with speech that we uh, uh, don't necessarily like because we want cohesion. We want really kind of to feel that we all are on the, on the same page. And if people say something else that really contradicts our worldview, there is some discomfort with that. Yeah. But it seems really necessary to allow enough of that because otherwise it seems to at some point split up. And that's kind of why I brought in this image of the shadow, right? Where you have like these elements in your own personality that might be anger or aggression or whatever. And you, if you don't integrate them at some point, they can, that there will be moments where they take over your life. And, you know, something like this happened just a few weeks ago. Yeah, no, no, I completely, um, you know, I, I completely agree with you. I think that, um, you know, a lot of people think that kind of freedom of speech is just, you know, sitting around the tea and the fire having, you know, lovely conversations. Actually, you know, it comes at a price and, and you know, people then debate what the, you know, if they're willing to pay that price. And often that price is that you will be kind of confronted with the, the alarming, the offensive, the, the dangerous, the distressing. But but in, in many ways, we, we argue that that's necessary for, for us to really understand the kind of depth and scope of our humanity and for the kind of cultivation of our own sense of individuality and agency. And so it is necessary um, in order to, as you say, kind of integrate the shadow to really um, realize that oftentimes the people that you find reprehensible, that there's kind of many aspects of them, if not fundamentally that they are the kind of same of same as you and if you had the kind of same experiences you may well have um kind of been that same person so i so i agree that um that you know one of the problems is this kind of assumption that people shouldn't be um exposed to kind of differing views but i guess that the challenge is how do we um how I think that there are still conditions that can exist in order to enable that process of engaging with different views to be one that is much more productive than a one that I think that we have currently where people just completely retreat, where, where people's kind of um, perceptions of one another are just purely this kind of one dimensional political abstraction. So I think we've kind of perhaps taken it um, too far where, um, wh where people are kind of being exposed to different views, but it's just purely from a kind of conflict or adversarial level. And so I think, um, I still think that that kind of work does need to be done to have that, that build that foundation, build that value system where we can engage with people that are um, opposites to us in many ways, but still um, engage with them in a really, in a, in a way that actually helps us to learn and understand. There's a quick follow-up. Okay, David. Sure. I mean, I, I, I just had a thought um, that there was a, there was an article I read today that talk, that dealt with the, this topic. Um, Jesse Single, who we've had on, before and I really like his kind of he, he's a very thoughtful writer um, and he he posted about the the Don McNeil story so Don McNeil was the science reporter who was just uh, sacked by the New York Times because of something that he said or was alleged to have said we don't quite know but it, he, he was alleged to have said various things on a on a group outing with a group of um, sort of teenagers the New York Times were running these trips to Peru and one of the things, and Jesse had a really interesting point. He said, initially, it sort of seemed that he had quoted the N-word in a kind of ambivalent context, and that was the reason. And then there was he was kind of made to resign. And the, the question was whether intent mattered and a, a very dangerous uh, precedent being set where people say, no, intent doesn't matter, which is kind of under, which undermines the whole rule of law effectively. But then, then another another fact came out that he seems to have said that racism is over, and uh, black people in America can can succeed if they want to, or something words to that effect. 
And Jesse said, is it if, if he has said that, and we don't yet know if it's the case, is it OK for him to be sacked for that? And Jesse said a lot of people might find that um, offensive, but he then looked at some survey data that showed that that's a perspective that's held by around 35 to 40 percent of people in the U.S., including about 25 percent of black people in the U.S., agree with that statement effectively. And he said whether, like in liberal circles, that's quite an offensive perspective. And, and Jesse said, I don't agree with that. I think there's there's massively deeply entrenched cycles of poverty and and all sorts of reasons why that's not true. And I, I'd agree with him as well. Mm -hmm. But his point was, if this is a view that's held by 35 to 40 percent of the American people, surely that can't be a firing offense within the U.S.'s main sort of paper of record. Like you can't, it, there has to be some understanding, like you can't be firing people for views that are held by a, by a large majority of the country, because that's just, it's not a workable solution, which I thought was an interesting article about that, that topic. Yeah, sorry. no, sorry. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I, I think in, in some senses, that's really what kind of my understanding fundamentally of what cancel culture is, because I think what, what we often hear that it is, is just you know, people that are just kind of uh, getting consequences for kind of racist or think horrible things that they've kind of said that they previously wouldn't have had consequences for. But I find that um, what I understand of cancel culture is, is a kind of backlash or a, or a, a way of uh, removing people from the public domain or unpersoning people for views that are actually widely, widely held, um, wh whether that is on, you know, kind of questions of race or, or all of these other issues. So uh, oftentimes it, it's actually opinion that are, if you do poll people, you know, relatively mainstream, but fall fall out of that kind of um, kind of elite liberal um, orthodoxy. Hmm. Jochen, what was your follow up? Uh, my follow up was so it seems to me that freedom of speech in an ideal world is just the recognition that words are better than throwing stones or hitting one another with swords or sticks or whatever. So like, depends what you're into, I guess. Uh, sure, but vi violence seems to be, or rather avoiding physical violence seems to be one of the reasons to use speech rather than violence. And so it seems maybe that in real world interactions, even if I now see you through Zoom, that seems to work well, whereas like on Twitter and these social media where you don't see the other person, it seems to always e much more easily devolve into something that comes as close to violence as you can on a text-based medium where you're like you make threats or like you use epithets or whatever. And so I'm wondering... If one of the things that people just need to learn is to how does it translate the the idea of like, okay, let's not use violence, let's use words into a medium where it is so difficult to be reminded of that because you don't see the other person. So, yeah, so, I, you know, I, I would... I um, agree with you um, on on the first part in relation to you know it, it's a way of you know dealing with issues without using violence. But I do think now in this domain it, it is slightly different because, for example, you know it, it's like much more constant. You know the the idea before you know pr prior to the internet, you know you might go to a kind of a salon salon or a university or kind of very specific spaces in which you'd kind of engage in ideas. But now you know particularly if you're kind of Generation Z, you know your your entire existence is kind of constantly kind of being commented on or constantly having opinions um you know you could you could easily have a thousand people um have a an opinion and i think that that's kind of very very unique um and, and i think that can actually be um something that is quite demoralizing um i think jonathan heights work talks about that that has actually translated um it into kind of genuine um kind of de deteriorations of people's kind of internal stability or you know internal constitution so i do think there are elements about um what's going on now that 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 is um more difficult so so perhaps um perhaps again i think that we perhaps need to be much more kind of selective in in, in how we use um these social media platforms as well uh, uh, and i think take having more autonomy and agency in in, in potentially saying that you know this particular one is not necessarily the, the, the right way for, for the things that I kind of want to engage in social media for. So again, you know, perhaps if you, you, you're you not looking for um, uh, that, that kind of domain, you might, you might use a different platform. So, and I think, especially with the kind of lockdown conditions this quickly, again, I, th I think it's really interesting that um, 
you know, I've been hearing a lot of conversations about people um, potentially arguing that we're, we're going to see uh, a, a much more significant kind of revivification of the, the kind of physical public square um, as a result of people, um, you know, being under these conditions where we haven't seen one another. So I, th- so I think it's harder um, in the online world to just kind of um, accept it if, if lots of people are piling on you. So I think there's some, something slightly different um, than perhaps what freedom of speech previously w- was understood for. Awesome. So let's, uh, there's some really good questions in the chat. So we're going to come to Melissa next. Hi, how are you? Um, uh, this is a great conversation. Thanks for hosting it. Um, so I was bridging off the conversation about moderation. I also am on Clubhouse as well. So I've been watching a lot of this go down in real time. Um, and so a couple of weeks ago, there was an incident where a New York, the New York Times published a pretty profound lie um, about a powerful Silicon Valley executive. And for anybody that doesn't know this, what happened, basically they accused this executive of saying a profanity, the R word. Um, in a conversation live on Clubhouse. I was actually in the conversation and he didn't say it, so I can verify that firsthand. Um, And then um, off the back of that was called out publicly by a lot of people on Twitter saying that it was a lie, retracted it kind of, um, but wasn't really held accountable for it. And so then there was this 5,000 plus people live room on Clubhouse with these very powerful figures from Silicon Valley dismantling, including Brett Weinstein, in fact, he was also on the stage that day, um, and um, just dismantling the whole concept of the um, current media structure. Um, And so then off the back of that, the New York Times wrote a hit piece trying to pull Clubhouse apart, essentially. Um, And then off the back of that, another room was started off on Clubhouse, actually multiple rooms. There was yesterday, there was around about 10,000 people in rooms talking about dismantling the New York Times. (laughs) Um, And so um, just speaking to all of this, it makes me wonder if moderation is, are necessary to ensure the validity and freedom of speech of free speech in within situations like this who moderates the new york times mm. no you know I, I think that's such a good question you know and there's two things i'd say to that firstly i i think that one of we should perhaps develop a kind of new social taboo where you know leaking um genuinely private um kind of text and things like that, particularly on these platforms, actually becomes, you know, incredibly social taboo. And we had that, um, you know, with revenge porn, you know, previously. So previously the girls um, would be kind of blamed as, you know, why did you do that? And now, you know, it's seen as something completely kind of scumbag if if someone does it because we genuinely see the consequences. And I think, you know, talking earlier about the kind of necessary preconditions for building this types of solidarity, One of them is is genuine trust and and sometimes it is confidentiality, you know, hoping that, you know, when you're in this open space that you'd be allowed to make mistakes or you may may be allowed to correct yourself or or kind of explore and experiment with ideas without without fear. And so I think I hope that that is actually going to be a kind of social taboo that evolves where this whole this kind of weaponization of many of the whether that's you know, lots of these platforms kind of leaking it um becomes something that is incredibly um deterred and I, I do think we need a kind of reaffirmation of the kind of division of the kind of private and kind of public square but in terms of your latter part in, in regards to who hold the new york times and, and and people like that accountable um you know I, I think it's us and and i think a lot of these um these uh, journalistic platforms have been unfortunately significant parts now of kind of poisoning um, the information kind of ecosystem um, as they kind of search for clicks and increasingly um, just use completely low level hit job kind of gotcha journalism the kind of very again institutions that we had previously relied on to kind of authoritatively um, provide information and I think I think that the response to that is us the kinds of kind of uh, kind of populism in, in relation to responding to them that we've seen where, where the kind of readership just plummets. I think that's genuinely um, what, one of the ways in which we, we, we challenge them. I think, it's, I think that's been one of the most kind of pernicious and insidious um, ways in which the, the kind of climate has been toxified, um, where the kind of, these kind of journalistic structures um, try and gain traction and popularity by these very kind of low level 
um, types of journalism. So, so I think that we we are the ones that um, really hold them accountable by completely um, by calling them out, essentially. Yeah, I I didn't know about. I mean, I knew about the Taylor Lorenz thing, but I didn't know that there was sort of a brewing. It kind of makes perfect sense that it, it sort of feels like this is likely to snowball if the New York Times is sort of starting to, because Clubhouse finally, maybe finally, but because it's so tied to um, a new form of do a new way of doing things, and it's so sort of based in Silicon Valley, there was there have been growing tensions for quite a long time between Silicon Valley and the New York Times, and especially sort of the tech journalists. So it does sound like this. This could accelerate. I mean, I, I'm more. I guess it's it's interesting to know to see where people's sympathies lie as well, because there's a lot of dislike and hatred of the big tech companies that a lot of people are are kind of making. Like that was that was Brian Rose's whole thing. Like he was able to kind of position himself as, oh, the big tech companies silencing me, and he he re- he sort of realized that 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 had a lot of currency. But Clubhouse is so new that it doesn't feel like Twitter or Facebook opposing the New York Times. So it's a really interesting dynamic. Like that seems to be where people are organizing. And I'm, I can see both sides. I do think that, I do think that tech tends to move fast and break things. And one of the things that it has broken is truth in a lot of ways. I think a lot of the, the problems that we're seeing in, in society more generally is because the dopamine loops, the performative aspect of communication on places like Twitter and Facebook and all of this that stuff has done immense damage to society. But at the same time, the New York Times and other papers like it have also become very corrupt, hollow, unaccountable. Like who watches the watchman is the classic kind of angle on that, like they've got away, they've they've been the sort of fourth estate for many years, and that's really gone to their heads. And so I can see it from both sides, and it's but it does sound like a perfect storm with Clubhouse right now. Like these these two events, like the and and also the New York Times, the Slate Star Codex piece as well was another one. Like that, it's interesting. There sort of seems to be a bro a brewing battle between the old establishment and the new establishment, which sounds. There's another power in this as well, David, in the sense that um, Andreessen Horowitz, so the article is about Mark Andreessen, for people that don't know who's the, um, one of the founding partners of Andreessen Horowitz, which is probably now the biggest institutional VC in Silicon Valley. And they, um, so they've actually started a media platform as well. So there's, there is a factor in here where they also have made a play inside the media, significant media space. So they also, they're the only major investor in Clubhouse. Um, they are the major investor in Substack. Um, they're the major investor in, I think, five other main media-based decentralised kind of platforms. Um, so it's also, in, they're a major investor in Facebook. You know, it's it's also important that they actually probably have quite a position of power to compete with the New York Times, as you know, if they really push this this line, so it's just an interesting power plays in there as well that that can't be overlooked. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, I I was just going to quickly say that um you know with all of that said I I do think that in some senses they they need one another like as much I I have criticised the kind of mainstream media a lot but I also think that the kind of loss of the authority of the mainstream media has has in many senses been quite detrimental. Uh, and, you know, we've spoken about that briefly in, in terms of the kind of the, the kind of uh, democratization of truth and the, and the kind of lots of mini kind of narrative warfares that emerge as, as no one kind of trusts a particular source and then retreat into one that kind of affirms or exaggerates their kind of pre-existing assumptions. And I also think the kind of new media is fantastic for the, the way in which, um, you know, lots of different types of people and, and lots of niches and, and different, you know, ideas can kind of emerge in a much more open way without that, um, you know, uh, rigid, rigid boundaries that are kind of gatekeeping knowledge or truth. And so I think both of them are kind of necessary um, for a kind of productive um, society in this kind of new space. And I think that ho- I'm hoping, I, I don't know if this is going to be the case, that they kind of end up refining one another. So the the kind of the kind of legacy media see that people are kind of 
uh, yearning for a different type of conversation and, and end up kind of uh, uh, altering the way that they do things in order to kind of appeal and then the kind of uh, the kind of legacy of the kind of new media um, when, when the kind of breakdown of, of truth is kind of accelerating as it has the, the kind of people then also look to kind of more authoritative sources in order to kind of break away from that kind of information saturation and so I'm not I don't think that we're at the, that point yet I still think it's right now quite an adversarial dynamic but I actually think that both of them are necessary um, uh, for, for a kind of productive society. Awesome. Eileen, you had a, a question. Yeah, a thank you. Thank you, Anaya. Um, what strikes me, I just finished watching a documentary on Prime that covered the Grateful Dead, and I can't help drawing some similar parallels between their early years where they had these freewheeling deadheads who followed them, and ultimately they became victimized by their own success. And I see similar parallels with the social media companies and the internet, that it was very Wild Westy in the early days. And as it evolved, all the success and all the people that came in created the challenges that we now face. Mm -hmm. And it seems everybody gets distracted trying to figure out who to blame and who to punish for these challenges we face, rather than turning attention to how do we deal with the challenges. So that's my question is not only how do we deal with the challenges, but how do we curate this vast body of information? I think it's more than just censorship versus moderation because we tend to censor that which we feel is poorly curated and we tend to moderate that which is emotionally reactive. So until we can get to the curation bit, we're going to struggle with that issue. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, um, you know, I, I agree a lot of the time, you know, something gets created and then particularly something kind of transformational like these tools, they often take on a life of their own and, and become much bigger and transcend the individuals um, that, that really created them. And, and it's almost as if th there's almost nothing that they can do to really rein it in. And so blaming them when in some senses it, it, it's so significant that it's affecting all of us you know, does feel kind of relatively futile, it, even if there are things that they are doing that could, could absolutely, you know, not at least make um, things worse. And so I think now that the impact of, of, of these tools are so significant, that I think the response has to be um, uh, with all of the various institutions and kind of levers that we do have societally. You know, one of the things that I've argued is I think it needs to, um, the, it needs to happen much earlier, you know, for, with kids, um, in schools, you know, how, how do you use these um, tools responsibly? How do you decipher between information that is perhaps uh, uh, disinformation and 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 or, or versus information that is kind of credibly sourced? Um, how, how do you very from very young have conversations and tolerate and engage with people of different views? And so I think I think that the response has to be multi pronged and multifaceted from from education, um, from also a kind of technological response, a kind of democratic response and a kind of response from the market I don't think because it's so transformational that we could just kind of all have a go at the social media giants and expect that um, the solution is going to emerge from there I think it's going to emerge and emanate from from civil society I, I, Eileen is your your questions mainly how do we curate the information flow yes mm. it's it's yeah it's the I guess it's the key com the key question. Um, it's interesting because I was listening to a very very good conversation between I saw someone in the chat mention John Wood Jr. and Braver Angels, who who has been on the who has been on the channel before. We've had him on Rebel Wisdom, but he has his own podcast and was talking to Matt Taibbi, who also has been mentioned in the in the chat. And Matt Taibbi is. And I, I'm, I'm trying to get to Matt Taibbi to come on because I'd like to have this conversation with him. So Matt Taibbi is a kind of veteran left-wing journalist who leans very heavily towards kind of extreme free speech because he's very, very suspicious of any of the attempts of the internet giants to kind of regulate it. But I heard in that conversation a few, like he wasn't an absolutist. And I heard one of the things he said in there was, he, he left it as a kind of open question. What 
Because whether the situation has changed with the tech companies, which is, I think, the key question, it's like, are we now in a fundamentally different situation? Which is, I think, what you're pointing to a little bit, Eileen, because of the nature of the information flow. And this is something that Tristan Harris talks about. He says, the First Amendment, most of our understanding about free speech is based on someone standing in a town square or not being silenced. Whereas what we have now is an infinity of different information. And that's that's the key problem. And I, I'd love to have, I don't know the answer to that. I, I do feel like, so you've got someone like Tristan Harris who argues that it is, that fundamentally it is a very different situation. We're in a, we're in a situation that the founding fathers could not have expected. We, the, the self-regulating power of truth has now been broken because of the nature of the algorithms, because of the nature of the overproduction of information that you can just, you can't, you can't knock down enough untruths because there's so many of them there's so many of them there. And then you had, like that was a deliberate political tactic by the likes of Steve Bannon. Like he talked about flooding the zone with shit, that that was the, the tactic. You didn't, you didn't have to sort of create an alternative narrative and it wasn't a case of sort of lying or spinning the truth. You just kept up this incredible barrage of different, different kind of misinformation so that they, the opposition just had no time to respond to all of it. So I do... And I would love to have Matt Taibbi and uh, Tristan Harris in conversation o- around that specific point. Is, is it genuinely broken? Because the perspective on Tristan Harris that I've seen a few libertarians have is, oh, he's just a new version of the kind of maiden aunt who wants to stop you talking about certain things, worrying about new technologies and these these kind of this whole social dilemma stuff is just the new reefer madness. And, um, and I, don't, I, ju- I don't know. I can see both sides of that argument. And I guess, I, I, I guess I'm more concerned. I, I, I veer more towards the Tristan Harris, certainly since the beginning of, of lockdown and the, the growth of the kind of misinformation narratives. And I do think some moderation has to be part of the answer. But I'd love to see those two battle it out. I think that would be that that would be a really interesting conversation to have. And it's about this uh, this question: Has social media, has the nature of the modern information ecosystem broken something fundamentally, mm. or are or are we just in the same position as we were when the printing press was invented and everyone was saying, "Oh no, look, all of these people are printing." Like it used to be just the priests who were able to print Bibles. Now everyone can print everything and the society's collapsing. And like you can make arguments from both sides. And I don't know what I think, if I'm honest. Yeah, no, I, I don't know um, what I think either. And I think, you know, one of the difficulties, you know, now is that, it, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of the time it's often the kind of powers that be that are part and parcel of that kind of process of toxifying the landscape we kind of alluded to you know, the kind of journalistic institutions as well. So it often becomes mm. this kind of feedback loop, um, this this kind of vicious cycle that is just out there in the open. Um, I, 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 I don't know the answer, but I'm, I don't think I'm kind of fatalistic. Obviously, you know, the nature of, you know, the, the kind of reality perhaps is the kind of spontaneity that emerges from it. And I think it's very interesting seeing how um, kind of some of the generational differences and how, social media is you. So for example, um, there's a, a lot more research coming out that younger people um, use very different platforms um, than perhaps people in their kind of 40s and 50s. Um, and so perhaps there will be shifts in, in, the, in the way in which these things are used kind of cross-generationally. But, but yeah, it's, um, I see both sides of the argument as well. And maybe there isn't an answer. Hmm. So Helena, you had a, a question. You might need to unmute yourself. I don't know if I remember what my question was. <laughs> I think I think what I'm thinking of coming from all this is um, maybe to have the objective is the obje- changing the objective so that it's more about just sort of um, being more focused on on diverse points of view. 
when you're discussing and being curious of that, as opposed to having this echo chamber where everybody is just agreeing. And I don't know if that, that involves a shift in groups, but being more open to, like focusing more on diverse points of view as opposed to just, you know, oh, okay, we're all in this group and then you get enemies, you know, then you're all of a sudden, you know, you see others as enemies, but it's sort of more of a, a different way of looking at conversation as you're sort of cooperating with other, others to find, to kind of explore and um, increase awareness and understanding as opposed to competing. Yeah, I, I like the, the that's why I like the integral model so much and the idea of different perspectives and different value systems. And I think a lot of people here will be familiar with that sort of multi multi perspectival and the the a lot of people summarize the meta modern view as the person who the person who dies with the most perspectives wins which i think is a really cuz cuz what i think you realize is and that's another maturity thing as well is that you realize that it's possible that some you don't have to collapse all the perspectives into into one you can understand that there are reasons for different perspectives and that they're, they're appropriate in different contexts and different situations. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it was Alexander Pope. There's that famous quote that, um, what is it? That um, some sign of maturity is holding two contradictory ideas at the same time. Yeah. Someone might know whether it was Pope or whether it was someone else. Um, but, but I also, the, the comment that I was interested in that Fiverr put into the chat was about the way things are said rather than the oh, content. Yeah. And right. that I think is a really important point. And it, and it gets kind of shut down as kind of tone policing, especially if you make it to an American. And it's something that, that Ian McGilchrist said in one of our interviews. He said, everyone should be allowed to say anything they want, but they, they must say it politely, effectively. And he was very, very... British about the whole thing. But I do think there's some truth to that. I mean, you you will get kind of shot down, especially in a, like I said, an American context. But I do think that's part of the reason why it feels to me that the UK has a healthier debate than the US. And, and there's various reasons for that. But I think one of them is that there is a, a little bit more of a norm around politeness, although there's a lot of passive aggressiveness underneath the surface, as um, I'm sure any British person will tell you. Uh, I, um, David, I can say something now I, I, sure. about if it's that you wanted to say, because I really do feel strongly that with all these kind of quick emails and quick comments that we write, that speech and language is getting destroyed. And we do things so fast and answer so fast. And quite frankly, I can't understand a lot of what people are trying to say sometimes because they've just reeled off a, a thought which seems so um, to make so much sense to them, but I can't make it. I and mean, sometimes I think it's just me that I don't speak their language. But, and also, I mean, I've given up. I think that I have to write something before I can actually speak it with any sense of sureness. Mm. And then added on to that one more thing, there's, I'm sure you're familiar with what Wittgenstein said about, about that our world is literally circumscribed by 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 language if we don't have language for it then we can't really know it it can't come in our world and i probably not um explaining that and um, like a philosopher would but I think, um i think we got it you're you i think that that's one bit. of the real dangers of the of the internet and and sort of this instant communication gratification that we have. We're saying a lot without 
really think I think we got most of that fiber. Your your internet's a little bit poor. I hope you're hearing us okay. So we're very close to to the end. Okay. Um, no worries. It says you're muted, but you're not. It's I've never seen that on on Zoom before. So we are going to have an after hours. Clay has kindly volunteered to host the after hours. Um, before we go to the after hours, I would, because I'm quite interested in Clubhouse because we, we've we just, there's been quite a lot of talk about it, quite a lot of talk in the chat as well. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more. Inaya, you've been on it quite a bit as well. Is that is that right? Have you taken part in many conversations? And I'd like to hear a little bit, um, yeah, maybe if we go like five minutes over or something, I'd love to hear any thoughts, any tips, any ideas or feedback that people have. And David Hagar has, has volunteered to, to hand out some invites to people if they want to join. You will need an iPhone. Inaya, what have you made of it? Yeah, no, I, I've just been dabbling a little bit um, just, just in and out. I've had a few conversations, but I've mainly, mainly been listening. Um, and I just think it, it, the way it's structured, I think is just, you know, it, ha it still has challenges, but I do think it's interesting that you, it has a kind of moderator. It has, you know, a uh, an audience and the kind of rules seem kind of relatively clear and it has a kind of value system um, and, and it's, it's really nice that it has those kind of clear guidelines and, and there's a kind of strong basis um, to which when you're going. And, and also the fact that it's invited. I also think that's a really interesting element. It, it's selective. And so that kind of at least attempts to weed out um, anonymous or trolls or those kinds of things. And so I think that those are quite unique elements about it that are very interesting. And I have seen a few really, really just um, productive conversations. And I think there is something about just hearing someone's voice um even just even without the video sometimes and you're you're able to kind of do other things but just listen to people and you can hear people's intonations and that gives a, a just much more compelling feel than just reading something so i think those kind of elements about it just give it a bit more um substantiation and a bit more hum humanity to it um but yeah it's it's still very very new um it still seems a bit elitist at the moment so it, it's kind of it'll be interesting if it does end up actually bringing in um, people from from perhaps different classes um, and, and, and having massive people. I'm not sure it has that yet. Mm. Melissa, did you want to say anything? Um, yeah, I've been running social experiments on it for, for I think, six plus months. <laughs> yeah, you, um, put, you pushed us to get on it like six months I ago. I did, six and plus months ago, so it was. Yeah. <laughs> and you were like, what? <laughs> um, but it was I'm glad that you to see you on there or now finally and I'm glad that you're doing the conversation with Dan because Jenny's fantastic and that's a great a great introduction into the platform as well um yeah I, I had um started a club that's now got I think it's got now plus 20,000 people in it um was one of the was when clubs first just started out um so that was pretty cool and then um being also co-moderating another club on information warfare, um, which has been super interesting. And they're sort of averaging, um, they do two talks a week and we um, averaging moderating live somewhere between 800 to 1200 people in the room at any particular time. Um, and those conversations are fascinating and sometimes contentious and difficult to moderate. <laughs> um, sometimes there's 20 or 30 people on stage all with different views. Um, so it's, it's, it been a really interesting experience for me just to even learn that skill um, across moderating really different conversations and different frameworks to do that with, like, to manage all of those voices and try and stay neutral in amongst it all and, and so on. So that's been, been fascinating. Um, and then just watching the graph, the social graph and the way that they've been thinking about social graphs has been fortunate to, to also be... Um, in a, a couple of closed clubs with the, the founders and listening to how they're thinking about social graphs and the way the social graph is engineered. And the, so for example, the invitation, the accountability attached to invitations, the way that they've tried to balance out the, um, 
uh, they, they had a problem with um, trolls and how they managed to mitigate that through bringing the, the follower graph back to an accountability level um, closer and closer to the original invitees. And there's like a whole heap of things that's done there, which I could talk about in all different ways for a while, but um, there's some been some really interesting and fascinating social outcomes from it. And I think I wrote in the chat before, one of the, the, the really interesting things that I'm seeing is there's like an almost natural marketplace for authenticity that seems to come out of the com out of the platform where someone that's being authentic somehow pops up and gets expelled by the platform and there's been quite a few really big deal ones and even though they've had people with very big followings and very big reputations have been spat out of the platform on both sides of the political spectrum. It's not political. It's about them um, being found to be inauthentic. And then... When you um, say spat out of the platform, out. What, what do you mean by that, Melissa? Sorry, I missed that. What do you mean by that spat out of the platform? Uh, I mean that there's been enough instance where they've, their behaviour, because it's voice and it's tonal and it's it requires... Like to be true in that situation, you can't fake that for hours and hours a day for weeks and weeks on end. There is a point where certain cracks show in the behaviour of people and their true selves come out. And when that happens to enough people, it's like a an edge case thing. When the edge cases build up, um, those people seem to get together and go, hang on, I've had that experience too. You had that experience too? And then they have a room talking about it live. They basically resolve it live on the platform and that person gets often expelled whether they're suspended for bad behaviour or just don't want to go back on the platform because they're not welcome in the social structure that they created anymore because wow. they were behaving in a way that was kind or authentic or or whichever way. So we've seen everyone from like marketing people that were scamming people all the way through to healers, all the way through to scientists, mis misinformation, like a whole spectrum of stuff come out and get removed from the platform. It's fascinating to see it. Mm -hmm. And it's just this natural evolution of like the marketplace of those connections coming to a place where they're like, oh, that's not right. Let's mm -hmm. all talk about that and decide how to move forward as a collective. Wow, what a fascinating topic! It's got all of the, all the gossipy stuff, but it's high-minded as well. So I'd love to. We can go there maybe sometime. Um, what? Just one thing I wanted to mention as well. Just the idea of voice as well brings us back to the. I was talking about the vagus nerve and polyvagal theory and how important that is for kind of moderating our behaviour. It's also di directly connected to voice. Voice is one of those things that is directly connected via the vagus nerve going through the throat to all of our other, like we can track and we've learned to track each other's state through our voice over a long evolutionary history. So I guess that that's something that we're picking up on a, on a subliminal level and that's being communicated all the time, no matter what the actual kind of propositional content is, we're picking up and we're moderating and we're understanding at this much deeper level with voice. That's so it's really interesting that's coming through in the in the clubhouse conversations. Awesome. So we will make the transition to the after hours. So just if you're not if you if you're new, so what we'll do, I'm going to move the the hosting to to Josh, and then uh, Josh and Clay will play one tune, which gives a little bathroom break before the the hour long after hours. Uh, before that. We are going to say thank you to Inaya. Thank you. Can we unmute ourselves and say thank you in our traditional rebel wisdom way? Thank you. 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 Since the beginning of Rebel Wisdom, we've been thinking about how to create spaces for people to have new kinds of conversations around big ideas, which is why we've just launched our digital campfire which is a central place for people to gather, to find the others, and to make sense together. It's a place to practice the skills we talk about on the channel. So we have regular sessions that help us improve our sense-making and also tap into our collective intelligence. And it's all hosted on a discussion platform called Circle, where you can have conversations around our films and articles or on any other topic you're interested in. We've designed it all to be participatory, so you can set up real-time conversations by creating a crew to dive deeper into different topics or practices. 
So we've got three different levels of membership. Wise Rebel, Explorer, and Sensemaker. All three levels have access to the digital campfire on Circle. And the Explorers also have access to the following official Rebel Wisdom Run sessions. So on Mondays, we have live sense making, which is a session where we come together to discuss a hot cultural topic. And then on Tuesdays, we have our academy sessions, where we have some of the best facilitators in the world teaching various skills. So for example, collective intelligence practice, facilitation training. Then on Thursday, we have our connection gym. And the sense makers are also invited to our Wednesday sessions, which alternates between Q&A and the wisdom gym. The Q&A is with one of the stars of our films and will often go up on the channel itself. And the Wisdom Gym is where we bring in some of the biggest names in transformation and growth to share their practices with us. Within Circle, we've also included a number of resources that we found useful. So sense-making tools, meditations, authentic relating games, and guides for how to host your own session. So the most important thing to remember is that this is an experimental space and is designed to be participatory. So it's really your space to come in and make your own. So we'd love to see you there.